everyone, I'm Walter Select. I'm the subject librarian for comparative literature and um, German, Germanic languages and literatures and German romance languages and literatures here at Olin Library. From the University Libraries, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming to our international, our first International Writer Series event of the fall semester with Mary Jo Bang. Um, just a few technical notes. This is a webinar, so your cameras and mics are turned off. Rather than having a Q&A at the end, this will last about an hour of discussion. Rather than having a Q&A at, a, a &A at the end, we are going to have a reception in another Zoom room after this um, where everyone can interact with each other. I'll put the link to that in the chat. In the meantime, um, I think that is all the announcements that I have. Thank you again for coming. And I'll hand it over to Matthias Guritz. Thank you, Walter. Welcome and welcome back for this first event of the third season of the International Writers Series, a collaboration between the International Writers Track of the program in comparative literature and the university libraries to celebrate new publications of creative works by writers and translators in our community at Washington University in St. Louis. Let me begin somewhere else. For hundreds of years, Dante's verses have been sung in the poet's county, in the poet's country, and just as love songs prepare boys and girls for love, so the ardent Florentine verses prepared Italian youth for the day of deliverance. From generation to generation, all communed with the soul of the poet and so transformed their slavery into freedom. I heard a laugh behind me and at once fell from the Dantesque heights. I looked around and saw Sorba behind me, his whole face creased with laughter. Nikos Kanzantzakis, Nobel Prize winning novel Zorba the Greek, first published in 1946, opens in a cafe in Piraeus. Just before dawn on a gusty autumn morning sometime after the end of World War I, the narrator, a young Greek intellectual, is just about to begin reading his copy of Dante's Divine Comedy when he feels he's being watched. Alexis Zorba, a Greek born in Macedonia, asks him for work. And the narrator, fascinated by Zorba's lascivious opinions and expressive manner, decides to employ him as a foreman. Zorba the Greek is a novel of great depth. It tells of the journey of two very different men through a series of comic and tragic situations. You can peel the story like an onion. There's always one more layer. Another perplexing thought pops up, another question. It is like its model, Dante's Divinia Commedia, at the three books, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso are commonly known, a journey into the meaning of existence. Befitting a text that has a poet, Dante, traveling through hell, then purgatory, and finally reaching paradise with Roman poet Virgil as his guide, tonight's program will offer us a unique opportunity to venture through one of the key texts of European literature. We will discover its liveliness and the many joys and obstacles it brought its translator with two poets of extraordinary talent, Mary Jo Bang and Aaron Coleman as our guides. It is my great honor to introduce our two guests tonight. Mary Jo Bang will present her recent translation of Dante's Purgatorio. Mary Jo is an award-winning and internationally acclaimed author of eight books of poetry and a professor of English here at Washington University in St. Louis. Her exploration of Purgatorio is the continuation of her journey with Dante, which began with her transformative version of Inferno, published by Grey Wolf Press in 2013. In her signature lyric style and in Purgatorio Now with notes after each canto, Bang has produced a stunning translation of this 14th century text, rich with references that span time, languages, and cultures. In Purgatorio, Dante, still guided by Virgil, emerges from the horrors of hell to begin the climb up Mount Purgatory, a seven terrace mountain with, with each level devoted to those atoning for one of the seven deadly sins. At the summit, we find the terrestrial heaven and Beatrice, who will take over for Virgil, who as a pagan can only take Dante so far. During the climb, we are introduced to the myriad ways in which humans destroy the social fabric through pride, envy, ego, and anger. 
Mary Jo's Purgatorio has already been greeted with high praise. The Chicago Review of Books calls it a, quote, rich and exciting translation and declares that Mary Jo Bang shows that, quote, a story for all time is a story for our time. Three Kans Reddy remarks on the fact that this thrilling sequel to Bang's Inferno maps a passage between hell and heaven for our purgatorial historical moment. Above all, this ingenious and artful translation reminds us that Dante's Purgatorio, like the divine comedy in which we are all extras, is a poem about love. And Susan Barnowski maintains that Mary Jo Banks' translation, quote, turns out to be every bit as meaty, luscious, erudite, straight talking and joyful as her time traveling inferno. Bang, Susan says, has an uncanny sense of how to slip inside and between Dante's light, guiding us along his most perilous path. The contemporary illusions in Bang's adaptations echo the audacious character of the original and slyly insist that whatever was true in Dante's era is still true today. Usain Bolt, Tutsi Fruit Shoes, the MGM logo, Leo the Lion, Amy Winehouse, Marvin Gaye, The Beatles, Bob Dylan, and Gertrude Stein are among those who make cameo appearances as Bang, with eloquence and daring, shepherds the divine comedy into the 21st century, where it continues to have a profound impact on its readers. Mary Jo has quite recently elected to deposit her papers in Olin Library's modern literature collection. The visitor will be rewarded by the opportunity to contemplate her poetic vision and practice. Mary Jo will be joined in discussion by Aaron Coleman, who received his PhD in comparative literature and an MFA in poetry from Washington University. Aaron is the author of Threat Come Close, Four Way Books 2018, which won the Great Lakes Colleges Association New Writers Award and Sand Trigger, Button Poetry 2016, which received the Button Chapbook Prize. He has also been the recipient of a Fulbright Scholarship, a Kave Kahnem Fellowship, and a National Endowment of the Arts Creative Writing Fellowship. Aaron is currently teaching as a postdoc fellow at the University of Michigan and is preparing his translation of Nicolas Guillen's poetry collection El Gran Zoo, The Great Zoo, for publication. Olin Library is currently working with Aaron to establish the Aaron Coleman papers in the modern literature collection. This collection promises more to look forward to for all of us fellow readers, translators, and poets. I would like to thank Washington University's libraries for making these events possible, as well as the Committee on Comparative Literature and simply all other departments of arts and sciences and numerous individuals who are involved. I want furthermore to take a moment to express my special thanks and deepest gratitude to our incomparable subject librarian, Walter Slecht, who is my partner in crime in setting up the International Writers Series. He is, as you have seen, currently overseeing all the technical stuff of the webinar. Let us now delve deep into Dante's cantos, or better yet, let us climb Mount Purgatory. Please join me in welcoming Mary Jo Bang and Aaron Coleman with a big round of virtual applause. Enjoy the conversation and the readings from Dante's Purgatorio during the next 60 minutes. So Aaron, hello. Hi, hey. this is great to be back. This is great to be back. I didn't wanna hop in here uh, too early, but no, thank you so much, uh, Matthias, for introducing us both. And, you know, Mary Jo, I'm just grateful to be uh, back here in conversation with you. Um, and as I understand, um, our plan is for you to read one of the cantos before we get into our conversation. So I'll shut my mouth. And let okay. You take it away. Well, and I want to say my thanks first to um, thanks to Matthias uh, Gors for asking me to do this for um, including me and the international writers. Um, I'm not international except Dante is, and so I can slide in on his coattails. Um, and thanks to Joe Miner, thanks to at the uh, library and to Walter Schlecht um, 
and the complete department. I'm very grateful that you're um, having us over tonight for a party. Um, I'm going to read Canto One of Purgatorio so that we can um, start with how that starts. Um, and so here it goes, Canto One. Heading over waters, getting better all the time. My mind's little skiff now lifts its sails, letting go of the oh so bitter sea behind it. The next realm, the second I'll sing, is here where the human spirit gets purified and made fit for the stairway to heaven. Here's where the kiss of life restores the reign of poetry. O oh, true blue muses, I'm yours. And where Calliope jumps up just long enough to sing back up with the same bold notes that knocked the poor magpie girls into knowing their audacity would never be pardoned. The fluid blue of the Eastern Sapphire pooling in the cloudless mid sky, clear down to the first curved horizon line was an even more delightful sight, having left behind the sad making dead air that had so messed with my chest and eyes. The gorgeous planet that says yes to love was turning the east into a total glitter fest, veiling the fish that formed her entourage. I looked right, focusing on the south pole, I saw four stars that had gone unseen since the first human beings. It was like the sky was having a wild night with these tiny blinking lights. Oh, sad-eyed lady north, widowed of a sight you would so love to see. After this mini stargazing party, I turned a bit toward the other pole where there the shuddering bear had already lumbered off. Nearby, I saw a man on his own. He looked like an elder statesman, one worthy of no less respect than a child owes a parent. His beard was long and salted white, ditto his hair, which fell forward onto his chest in two thick bands. The rays of the four sacred stars gave his face the glint of a minted coin. I pictured a searchlight sun in front of him. Who are you who've turned the dead end river on its head by getting out of jail without a card, he said, his venerable feathers ruffled. Who guided you or acted like a flashlight when you fled the fathomless night gloom that keeps the infernal valley forever in the dark? Have the laws of the abyss been broken or has heaven weakened the law so you damned ones can come right up to my rock face anytime you like? My teacher gave me a look, then using head nods and hand gestures made me kneel and bend my head in deference. I didn't come here on my own, he said. A woman came down from heaven and begged me to help this one by coming with him. But since you want to hear the whole story, the unabridged version of how and why we came to be here, I can't say no to that. This man hasn't seen his final evening hour. Playing a fool's game, however, he was so close, there was very little time for a turnaround. As I told you, I was sent to help him stay alive. There was no other way to do that except the one I set for myself. I've shown him the guilty ones, and now I need to show him those spirits who purify themselves under your sovereign say so. It's a long story how I brought him this far. Power descended from on high and helped me bring him to this place where he can see and hear you. I hope you'll agree to his coming here. He's seeking freedom, the price of which is known by those who give their lives for it. You know this, death for the sake of it wasn't bitter in Utica where you shuffled off your mortal coil, which will be so bright on that one fine day. We haven't violated any eternal edicts. He's alive and I'm not tied to minnows. I'm of that circle where the innocent eyes of your Marsha show how much she longs to still belong to your pure and most, most loving breast. For her love then, I hope you'll give us the go ahead. Let us travel through your seven kingdoms. I'll take word of your kindness back to her. That is, if you don't mind your name being dropped below. I so loved setting eyes on Marcia when I was far from here, he said, that I never said no to whatever she asked for. 
But now that she's on the far side of the river, pain, she no longer moves me. That law was decreed when I was airlifted out of there. But if, as you say, a heavenly woman moves you to act and acts as your handler, there's no need to flatter. It's enough to ask in her name. So go, tie a simple reed around his waist and wash his filthy face. Make sure you scrub off all the grime. There's no way he can go in front of the first of the ministers from paradise, looking as if he got caught in a smoke cloud. All around this small island, at the lowest most point, where the sea waves sway, tugs at the rough stones, rushes grow in the soft silt. Plants with leaves or woody stalks don't last there. They get badly broken by the surf's steady rasp and after rasp. Don't travel back this way. The sun now rising will show you how to take an easier route up the mountain. With that, he vanished into the air. I got up without speaking and turned to my teacher, looking straight into his eyes. He said, son, you can follow me. Let's go back. The plane slopes that way down to its lowest point. Dawn was, Dawn was out racing the after midnight hours running in front of it. I could see even from this distance, the fluttering edge of the shore. We made our way over the desolate plain like someone looking for a lost path who until it's found feels like it's all in vain. When we came to an area where because of a cool breeze, the dew held its own against the sun's evaporative reach, my teacher opened both hands and placed his palms lightly on the wet grass. Now seeing what he had in mind, I offered him my tear-stained cheeks. And right there, he revealed all my true colors, which hell had kept hidden. We then went down to the, to the deserted coastline, which had never seen anyone navigate its waters and come back after the fact. There he tied the reed around my waist as the other had directed. Oh, one for the books. When he pulled up the lowly plant by its roots, another at once sprang up in its place. Thank you so much, Mary Jo, for starting us off with the first canto that way. Um, again, just let me, I, have, I can't say this enough. Congratulations on the completion of another uh, another book of the of the Divine Comedy. Um, it's really, you know, it's wonderful to sort of see what you've done with the work. And also too, as I mentioned before, as we were talking, you know, the beginning of my MFA experience at Wash U coincided with the launch of uh, Inferno. And I remember being at that book launch uh, during my MFA years and just sort of astounded by the, by the level of the work there. And so it just really, um, it feels full circle to get to be back at Wash U uh, to talk with you about it. Um, and also before I hop into any questions here, just so that we're all on the same page, um, everyone that's in the audience that I cannot see but know is there. Uh, I'll ask two or three questions, then we'll have a pause and Matthias will um, move us towards Mary Jo reading another canto. And then I'll also ask two or three more questions after that. And that will wrap up our hour before we move into the break, the, you know, to, the, to the separate room afterwards to sort of chat with everyone more informally. Um, so without you know, further ado, and again, you know, on my hunch that most of the people here are writers and translators themselves, I kind of wanted to begin with uh, a more general question, um, which is really just asking you, Mary Jo, how do you think about the relationship between your work as a translator and your work as a poet? Um, and how do they influence each other? Um, are they, do they get in the way of each other? Or just kind of how do you think about that relationship? Well, I think that um, there is one way it gets in the way, you could say, and that's because it takes so much time. Um, and so I think for me as a writer, I'm not a, a, a poet who has a schedule of writing. I have to wait for divine inspiration and um, that lightning bolt that hits you. But at the same time, I'm always attentive to um, language that I might want to repurpose or um, situations that I want to react to. And so I'll tend to store up all of those things and then when I do sit down, it's almost like I open that door to my 
forehead and, and look down and it all falls out. Um, and so I don't have those opportunities to open that little door as often, but at the same time, I think I learned so much and have learned so much from translating. I, I remember being asked um, at some point when I was working on Inferno, if I thought that working on the Dante was influencing my work. And I said, no, I, I really hadn't seen any evidence of that. But I think it was only when I began doing um, Purgatorio, and maybe that's because it took seven years of working on the Inferno. And then during those um, years, I, at the end of them, I sat down and wrote a lot of the poems that um, became A Doll for Throwing, which was published five years after Inferno was um, published. But this time, while I was working on Purgatorio, which was another eight years, I was writing poems. And um, I could look at some point, I could get some distance and think, I think I see evidence of influence the same way that, you know, if you read the collected works of anyone, you're going to be influenced. And I began to wonder what that influence was. What, what was I seeing? And what I decided I was seeing was a desire for clarity. And I think it's because Dante is presenting particularly in um, Paradiso and in, um, I mean, Purgatorio and later in Paradiso, very complicated issues, like how does the soul get in the body? And so he has Stasius explain, in so fact, Virgil says, Stasius, you take over, um, you tell him how. And so Stasius, the second Roman poet, explains to Dante how the soul and at what point the soul and all about how the corporeal body is working alongside divinity to come up with a body with a soul in it. So these are massively complicated issues. And yet he was making it clear and not easily clear. I mean, I had to do a lot of work uh, reading a lot of commentary and sitting for a long time with some of those words, like how to put these words together in a way that makes sense. And a lot of the translators who, um, you know, maintain a kind of allegiance to the original, their translations are just as clotted in terms of making those things clear. Now, because I'm not a dentist, um, I had the really good fortune of becoming friendly with a dentist, a British dentist, um, Nick Havily. And Nick was willing to um, field whatever questions I had. And so when I get stuck, I could email him and say, I really don't get you know, how the blood supply here is interacting with this um, message from God. And he would point to me to different sources or give me explanations. And so then I could come up with something that I thought was exactly what Dante would say. I'd show Havily and he'd say, well, you're close, but you know, you've, you've left out this kind of element. It's like, okay, try again. And then again and again, um, he would get me closer to the truth. And um, I'm so grateful for that because as I say, it's a very complicated book. But I think that as I was writing poems, which are always complicated, as you well know, um, I think before I, before I met Dante and was his student, yeah. I think I just um, felt that I didn't wanna be reductive about all of these complicated things. And therefore I wouldn't um, compromise the language because I didn't want it to be expository or explanatory. But I think Dante taught me how to do it 
in a way that isn't expository or explanatory. I hope so anyway, because I found myself finding new ways to um, not hide behind the language, but to take risks in terms of my own subjectivity, in terms of trying to represent the complications of the world. And um, I'm, I'm quite sure I, I wouldn't have been able to do that, or I might not have seen a model, or I might not have had the inspiration or whatever, but you know, our, our brains are these um, tangled webs of um, experience and every experience we have gets encoded. And so spending 15 years in the presence of this brilliant poet and really, I mean, I'm in awe of his brilliance and erudition because he includes so much, so many, um, theories and stories from myth, from uh, the Bible, from history. And just think, he doesn't have Google. You know, he, and he didn't have a library because he was exiled and he's moving around. So he can't have a U-Haul full of books that he's pulling with him. So it's in his head. And what's in his head is just uh, awesome. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Thank you for, for give, sharing that context with us too. Yeah, I mean, what would I do without Google and my, my U-Haul full of books too? <laughs> I need that myself. But no, I, I'm really glad that you spoke to sort of the complication of the text and how difficult it was to um, sort of get yourself inside of it and then express it in your translation. Um, and you know, one of the ways that I felt that you really expressed some of that complication and also gave us sort of a foundation and ground to, to grasp it was via the paratext and apparatus that you created around the book. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the notes later. I have a question about that. But I was just really, I was just really um, grateful for your introduction and the way that it sort of framed the text and created a kind of doorway into the, the narrative uh, movement of the text. But also beyond that, it also really just kind of felt like a meditation on Dante's journey but also, you know, because of the way that the introduction is um, in the second is a second person address, also sort of in interpolating the reader on that journey as well too. Um, and so, if you don't mind, I'd love to just read um, the second paragraph from your um, from your introduction because of the way that it does that work of, you know, not I I I resist saying that it encapsulates, but really it kind of uh, meditates on, reflects on, and gives a new context um, for what the for what purgatorio can mean to us um so i'll just read that second paragraph here and um then i'll just ask you a general question about the introduction um i should say just very briefly that this paragraph is um following an opening paragraph that reminds us of what we've traversed in inferno and how we got to this point i quote here that's all behind you now and yet it's never out of mind you never forget the lessons you learn by looking into the souls of others, nor should you. But here, unlike in hell, things will get better. It's safe to lift the metaphoric sails. All you have to do is walk up seven flights of steps, circle seven terraces, and you'll be at the terrestrial heaven where Beatrice, beloved since childhood, is waiting. That's only seven stories, a cinch, but hold on, only in fairy tales do wishes work snap just like that. This is real life. On each of these terraces, you have to evolve, feel the weight of your earthly errors, pay down the debt of every mistake you've made, learn compassion. That's what this long haul is for. And so, you know, I just, I, I felt like that moment really sort of encapsulated the way you bring the past into the present um, and, and the way that the present sort of echoes the past and how you just connect the book in that way um, to, to where we are right now and to both, you know, politically and socially, but also emotionally and personally always as if those things, you know, could ever be sort of separated out. I know they can't be. Um, so my general question is just sort of where did you get the idea to create this sort of introductory frame um, for the book and um, how do you see it working in service of, of the poem itself? Well, it's a funny uh 
the answer is very funny, I think. Um, when I finished the um, Inferno, I was I, I knew I had to have a translator's note, and I thought I also had to have an introduction. And all of the translations I had been reading had these um, really academic introductions because basically they were translations by scholars. Mm -hmm. And it was the history of Dante and the history of the times and all of this um, information. I don't have that. And I felt that if I tried to pretend that I was going to fail, plus that seemed not in dialogue with what I had just done. Mm -hmm. So what could I do? And I happened to go to New York to visit friends and all I could talk about every time I saw someone is I'm stuck. I've got to turn this thing in. I don't know what to do for the introduction. What do you think? And it's like, oh, just write a poem. It's like, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> well, somebody else would say, do this, do that, you know, get someone else to do it. Um, nothing felt right until the last night before I was leaving. I went to my friend Mark Bibbins' house and um, he was fixing dinner for me. And again, I'm telling this story of being um, at this crisis point. And he said, well, it's easy. Here's your introduction, heaven, but not yet. Uh. And I said, oh my God, yes, that's brilliant, Mark. That's how I'll begin. He said, no, 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 that's the whole thing. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you're you're wow. no beginning, just that, and then you start. And it's like, well, I can't do that, but you have given me a way to begin. And so that's how I started the um, introduction to Inferno. And it's like, heaven, but not yet. First, you have to get out of that dark forest. Mm -hmm. You have to encounter these beasts. You have to meet the Roman poet, um, Virgil, you know, who says to you, you want to get out? The easiest way to get out is go deeper in and I'll take you. And so as I was doing it, I could just keep telling the story, but as a kind of um, avatar for Dante. And um, I didn't want to give too much away. And so I didn't... Um, include everything. Right. And in fact, one of my concerns was, well, now you don't have to read the book because I've given you this summary. But I felt like, no, it doesn't hurt to know where you're going to go, because right. otherwise you can get lost. And this gives you a sense of where you're headed toward. So that made it easy with Purgatorio to um, think, okay, I want this to be in dialogue with Inferno. So I start with, finally you're here, where the sea meets the feet of Mount Purgatory. You did it. You survived hell and its horrors. You traveled through hell's ugly inner lobby and all nine hideous circles, etc. cetera. Um, and so it really like was such a perfect solution. Um, I don't know what I would have done had I not had Mark not given me that because I really was stuck. Well, I agree. I mean, it, it works so well for me. And then as we talk about it, it also feels like it's its own form of translation, you know, sort of preparing us for the text. And, you know, yeah. I think I can't remember where I read this, but somewhere along the way, or maybe it was in the trans your translator's note after that, but sort of thinking about this, your translation of Purgatorio as this way to also invite other people into a deeper exploration of Dante. And sort of, you know, so many readers, I think, uh, can see the length of these poems and not necessarily feel a way to step into it. And you just created such a, a perfect door to get into it. So, I, you know, I really, I thought that it was, you know, um, it just worked so well for me and I was grateful for it and, and grateful for the voice that you created in it. Um, moving more closely to the text now, um, and I, you know, I think that you demonstrated this, you know, even in reading the first canto, there is such a, um, the way that you were able to convey the suffering and the somberness of, of the souls that Dante encounters and the situations that he encounters, 
is always sort of balanced against, for me, what feels like this undeniable sense of wonder, of, of sort of moving through the space and sort of exploring it. And we as readers are going along with Dante through that experience. Um, and with that wonder, there's also maybe a deep empathy that we'll talk about more in terms of the characters that are met. Um, or I should say historical figures, every, you know, myths, every, you know, beyond characters, some of them doesn't really quite encapsulate. Um, but my question is, as a translator, how did you find ways to sort of balance this, this tone that is both full of a kind of somberness and sorrow and at the same time, wonder um, and a sort of exploratory, um, yeah, an exploratory wonder and, and, a, and an empathy um, that sort of keeps everything moving. I think Matthias said liveliness was a word that that comes because I agree that the, there's that tonal dynamism really sort of moves us through the text. So I just wondered how you created that balance. Well, I think that um, there are a couple of elements. One is that I switch sometimes from being um, a translator to being a human being and, and probably a human being who's also a poet. So in that second um, paragraph of the introduction, when you were reading, um, that's all behind you now, and yet it's never out of mind. You never forget the lessons you learn by looking into the souls of others. Moments like that, and whether it's my text or his text, I bring to bear what I know as a person and what I've suffered as a person. Um, just by being alive, we, we do suffer. Um, yeah. We're not always beloved and we wish we were. Um, and so I think that when the language cues me that this is what's going on, what Dante is, is himself either feeling or trying to create empathically, then I give it my all and I start imagining how that feels. So for instance, um, you know, he's on the terrace where those who uh, suffered from envy are and they have their eyes shut, sewn shut with fine wire. And this is so they can't look around and envy what somebody else has. And they are all dressed in the same color as well. And it's the color of envy. We always think of envy as being green, but it was um, livid blue. Uh, kind of purple color and their dresses, gowns, robes um, match the, the, um, the wall, the cliff wall of the mountain behind them. So there's nothing that they can want that is different from what they have. And so that this forces them to think about all the time and energy they spent looking around and wanting what others had and then trying to get what others had. And, and so they're crying um, because of their sadness. Um, and um, they're crying, Dante uses the term, uh, the tears were falling like spilt milk. And that um, simile is a way to also say that spilt milk is what you can't undo. Can't That's undo spilt that. milk, you can't go back. And so he's always talking about some, these things in a way that one can embody and think about one's own spilt milk, um, one's own regrets that can't be undone. And if you do that as a translator, instead of just looking up words and trying to find the word to word equivalency, I think that with a poet like Dante, who has such an emotional range in, in, in these three book length poems that you can create for any given moment, whether it's humor, and there's a lot of humor in, um, in all three books, but particularly in Purgatorio. Um, so, you know, whether it's humor, whether it's sarcasm, whether it's, um, pain, whether it's sorrow, I try to get inside that uh, as a human being who happens to be translating. I really, you know, I, I see that maybe Matthias is ready to hop, uh, hop in here, but just to, to kind of highlight 
what you said, Mary Jo. I think you may have just sort of turned a light bulb on for me in a way because it's 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 exciting to think about how dwelling in the metaphors or similes or, or, or figurative language of a poet can be a way to sort of think about how they ought to be translated by sort of dwelling with what are the ramifications of this particular metaphor, even if I have to change it because of the language and the structure, dwelling in the emotional reality of that is a way of helping me uh, access maybe the poetic side of myself that will help me actually translate it. Um, you know, so that's great to just think about the, the figurative language, language as a sort of empathetic vehicle to explore the text in a different way. That's, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. And to just so, highlight the humor once more in the ninth so, stanza of Canto One, you read it to us. It was like the sky was having a wild night. <laughs> so Emily Dickinson is coming in. It is actually very funny, but beautiful at the same time. You turn it into a Bob Dylan line or sad eyed Lady Norse. And you are so playful with that uh, without really losing uh, the trajectory of the narrative and all the kind of layers of sorrow, which we will encounter now in your second reading part from the next canto. Well, thank you for the, both of you for those comments. Okay, I thought that um, I just read Canto two, so we'll continue with the story. So Canto two, the sun had already reached the horizon of the meridian circle that at its height covers Jerusalem like a lid. On the circle's other side, night was emerging from the Ganges with the scales that fall from Libra's hand when dark outweighs the day. So that from where I stood, the white and red cheeks of pretty Aurora had after so long become washed out. We were still alongside the sea, like those who conjure the road in their minds, then set out while their bodies remain behind. Just then, like when caught red-handed by morning, Mars blushes red behind a thick mist low in the west over the ocean. That's the way I saw, I can still see it, a bright light traveling so fast across the sea that nothing with wings could equal its speed. In the few seconds that it took me to turn and ask what's that, it had grown much larger and brighter still. Then on the other side, something indecipherable, a seeming whiteness and underneath it, little by little, another emerging whiteness. My teacher didn't say a word until the first white areas resolved into wings. When he saw it was the coxswain, he shouted, get down, get down on your knees. Look, it's one of God's angels. Put your hands together. From now on, you'll see overseers like these. See how it rejects human methods? It doesn't want an oar, no sail other than wings, even on a long haul like this. See how its wings point toward heaven, handling the air with those eternal feathers that never lessen, unlike human hair. As the divine bird came closer and closer, it kept growing brighter. Finally, I looked down to avoid the blinding light. It came to shore in a sort of airboat, so light and swift, the boat only skimmed the surface. The hull hung in the wind above the water. The celestial navigator stood at the stern, looking as if blessedness had been etched upon it. More than a hundred spirits sat before it, singing in unison, maintaining a single melody when Israel went out of Egypt, on and on until the end of the psalm. It made the sign of the Holy Cross over them, after which the spirits all rushed onto the shore. Then it left the way it had come, quick as a wink. The crowd that stayed, looking all around, seemed like strangers in a strange land, pondering a brave new world. The sun, having already booted Capricorn out of the mid-sky, was now shooting dark light rays of daylight everywhere. When the new people turned and faced us, saying, if you know, please show us the on-ramp for the road up the mountain. You probably think we know everything about this place, Virgil answered but we're also travelers, just like you. We arrived just before you by another road, so steep and rough, it'll make this one seem like a game of chutes and ladders. The spirits, once they could see I was breathing and thus clearly still alive, turned a whiter shade of pale in astonishment. The same way, no one shies away from the messenger holding an olive branch, but instead presses in to get the breaking news. So every last one of these fortunate souls fixed their eyes on my face, 
as if forgetting to go and better themselves. I saw one approach with obvious affection as though wanting to hug me. I was so touched, I found myself moved to do the same. Oh, spirits, empty except as sim simulacra. Three times I clasped my hands behind his back and each time they came back to my own chest. Amazement must have been written on my face because the ghost smiled and stepped back. I pressed forward following him. He gently told me I should let it go, at which point I realized who he was. I asked whether he could stay a while, uh, stay a little bit longer and talk. The way I loved you when I wore my mortal state, he said, I love you the same, released from it. So I'll stay, but why are you coming through? Here, my dear Casella, is where I hope to return to, so I'm taking the road now. But why were you passed over for so long? I don't feel slighted, he said, if the one who decides who it will pick up and when has more than once said no to my going. It only ever wants what's fair and just. For three months now, it's actually been willing to take on anyone who wanted to go. I was just standing there facing the shore where the water from the Tiber enters the sea when it kindly said I could join it. Right now it's flying back to the river Delta. That's the eternal meetup spot for those who aren't dropping down to Acheron. If there's not a rule that wipes your memory of those love songs that used to soothe me when desire was burning down the house, would you be willing to give a little aid and comfort to my soul? It's utterly exhausted after having loved, lugged my body all the way here. Love reasoning out inside my mind, he began to sing so smoothly that the cool melody still plays deep inside me. My teacher, I, and all the others with him seemed totally content as if our minds were emptied of everything but this. We were mesmerized, intent on the music, when hello, here was the venerable old man shouting, what's this, you spiritual slugs? What's this foot dragging? Get to the mountain now and throw off that checkered snake skin that holds you back from knowing God. Suddenly, like pigeons at a breakfast buffet, calmly pecking at a rolled oat or shredded wheat, showing no signs of their usual puffed up hubris. If something frightens them, they instantly abandon what had acted like a lure, hijacked now by a far more pressing concern. That's how I saw this new group stop listening to the singing and run toward the slope, like those who go with no idea where they'll end up. Nor was our own departure any less quick. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thanks for reading that second canto. Um, there's just, I mean, it's a perfect segue really into my next question about this vernacular voice that um, is just so capacious that it's, it is, that, you know, it, it, it's, it, it is flexible enough to bring in so many illusions that, um, that just give a certain richness to the text in and of themselves. But at the same time, you know, that vernacular voice, um, it shows up in the voices of the figures as well that, 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 um, that populate the different cantos. And particularly we saw that um, just in this past one, speaking to um, his musician and friend, Casella, um, that sort of the tenderness in that moment. Um, you know, I, I'll, add, I'll say a little bit more about that in relation to the notes in a moment. But I just wanted to sort of ask you um, how you conceived of this sort of vernacular voice in your translation and how that helped with translating the voices of so many others, right? Because the poem is both Dante, but so many other, you know, Dante the character, I should say. I and mean, so many folks within the poem um, speaking and interacting with him. And, um, you know, something, just one other thing to add to that, um, that question about the voice is that it seems like it's also a vehicle for sort of keeping the momentum of the poem and pulling us forward through what is happening. Um, and I just, I hear each individual voice um, so clearly. So I wonder just how, how you went about um, crafting that. Well, I think there are so many different elements. Um, and, and first I should say it was an evolution that mm. when I started, this was a bit of a lark. When I started back with the first three lines of um, the first canto of Inferno, it was because I had um, 
read this found poem by Carolyn Bergvall, a poet um, who had taken the first three lines of 47 translations of Dante and then appended each three lines with the name of the translator. And later she made a, a really mesmerizing sound piece out of that, which is online. Um, and there were several things that uh, struck me about reading when I was reading that poem. One was that each translation out of 47, they were all different. And she had at the top, the three original lines in uh, Italian, which are fairly straightforward. I came to myself at, at midway in our life, I came to myself in a dark wood, the right path had been lost. But no one over hundreds of years had said it the same way. And some of what dictates how any translator says something in a poem is sound. And so everybody has their own relationship to that. Some people um, elevate the register and include words like thoust and canst as a way of gesturing to the fact that it's an old poem. But of course, those, those English words don't come from the 1300s when this poem was written. They come from maybe, you know, 1700s, um, 1800s, not all the way back then. You, you couldn't understand it probably, it'd be an Anglo-Saxon verse. Um, and so it didn't, that didn't make sense to me. And even when they weren't going that far in terms of um, the language, it was still very elevated. Right. And it seemed to me there was nothing in that Italian language that keyed elevate this language. Right. And then, so I started playing with those first through lines and then got so um, amused by it that I went to the library and got like a dozen translations and did the next three lines and then decided I would do the first canto. Right. But my tone at that time was really um, silly. I had a Freud finger puppet. I had geez, Miss Louise. I had all kinds of crazy things. Irreverent and different. Irreverent ways. and because who cared? I was just doing this experiment. Um, and then when I finished that, I decided I would do the whole um, in Inferno over a lifetime. I was in no hurry. And then at some point after I'd done a couple of cantos, I got a residency in Italy and discovered um, a huge unabridged um, bilingual English Italian dictionary. And suddenly everything changed because I thought, what about <clears throat> doing what I'm doing, but with rigor? And now I have access to the meaning of all these words in Italian. What if I try to translate it? And so everything changed as far as tone. And then later I would go back and rewrite those first three uh, cantos. And um, as I did the translations, I began reading about Dante's plan for this poem. And it turned out he wanted it written in the vernacular. And he had very uh, specific arguments for why. Mm -hmm. He said, literary Latin, which would have been the usual language for an epic poem, is too cold. Mm -hmm. And we want, he said, you know, you want to write a poem in the language with which you speak to your family, your friend, your beloved. Mm -hmm. It has to have warmth. And literary Latin is frozen in time. Mm -hmm. I want this poem to change over time. And I thought, well, that seems like what people had been putting it into language wise seemed the equivalent of literary Latin to our ear. Mm -hmm. And that kind of formality, that kind of allowing it to get frozen in the past. And so part of my whole project is to bring the language into the present moment. Yeah, and yeah. then there are many moments where Dante is incorporating popular culture from his day. And, but if we use that popular culture, the poem might still seem like a literary artifact from the, the you know, medieval era. But what if, if I can find a translation equivalent that fits it, 
it could speak about both. So one example, um, I'll just give this one. There's um, at some point he says um, that he's, I think it's a bird, the herald of dawn. And so herald, we, you know, we sometimes use that as a verb, something heralding something, but we don't generally talk about heralds as the announcers. Um, and so when I look up, and I look up almost every word, herald, to see how many other options I get, I get announcer. Well, the announcer of dawn doesn't have a lot of word or a sound play to it. So I look a little further, and under announcer, I get DJ, the yeah. DJ of dawn. And of course, a DJ is an announcer. The DJ announces which song just played, which song is coming up, maybe even, you know, we're going to hear the weather now. And mm -hmm. so that moment of the DJ of dawn brings, it, it sacrifices nothing in my mind wow. in terms of, of the actual accurate translation, but it sets it firmly in this moment. Right. Uh, uh, and I feel like that's what, I'm, I'm thinking Dante wanted. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for expounding on that in that way. Because I, because, you know, that to me is another, that's one of the things that um, drives the momentum of, of, of the translation. And also, it's just such a delight to read, as we saw in the second um, canto just now, from the moment of, um, you know, the shoots and ladders moment, or, or even, you know, you spiritual slugs, like I, I find myself looking for situations where I can use that in my life right now. Um, but, you know, it, the, the language is just so alive in that way. Um, and, you know, that, I guess, a, a pivot into that, another way, another way that the language feels so alive um, that also showed up in that second canto is um, that, you know, the, the moment of Casella that I mentioned before, and here, my dear Casella. And, you know, this is, I kind of want to use that to segue into my next question about the notes. Um, and more of the paratext, because I found for myself um, that I was reading the canto as, as its own, you know, complete totality first, and then going to the notes, which are positioned at the end of each canto, rather at the end of the collection, um, spending time with that, and then going back and reading the canto again. And I just felt, you know, meaning and possibility and inferences just um, proliferate after spending time with the notes. Um, and that here, my dear Casella moment um, draws from Marvin Gaye's 1978 album. You know, I have a personal love for Marvin Gaye, but it, it, it just, it draws from Marvin Gaye's 1978 album of that same name. And because that resonance is sort of hidden in the text based on what, our, what we bring to it as readers and our relationship to exploring the, um, the, the notes afterwards, it just really, it brings the text to life and puts it in our moment and helps it sort of Trans, uh, you know, it connects not just our moment and Dante's moment, but all the the centuries in between in this way that just feels very dynamic for me, um, including so many of the Shakespeare things that are brought in as well. That's another way of sort of things that fit naturally in the text that couldn't be there um, chronologically wouldn't make sense, but are still nonetheless just perfect fits for the text um, living in our in our current moment. And so, you know, my question with all that in mind is really just sort of how did you decide, uh, how, do, how do you see the notes and translations, uh, the translation of the text itself working together? And you know, how did you decide to place them at the end of each canto rather than at the end of the text? And um, yeah, just how did you decide on that whole overall structure of the book? Well, I think that I wanted the experience that you described of not having to go all the way back to the, the book and then, you know, how you often kind of have to keep finding which canto you're on. And um, so I wanted it to follow quickly and I wanted the text to be in your mind when you had the, the access to the note. And then initially I thought I'll just do those names in the text that somebody would be confused, like, who is that? It's somebody from myth or somebody from history. But as I began to then incorporate um, the poets and songwriters that have existed since Dante's time, those notes were so I wouldn't get into trouble of appropriating someone else's intellectual property. Um, but I realized I was creating a texture that was like 
the the work, but now a different kind of um, text, note text, but with its own texture. And I realized what I was doing was keeping the reader, bringing the reader along. This is how I got this. This is how I got that. This is why. So um, like the that description of the sky with um, Sad-Eyed Lady North, you know, North is in there and he says, North, um, you know, you'd be widowed of this site. So sad-eyed, and, and there's some other adjective that, that suggests sad. Sad, you sad Lady North, um, you know, you've been widowed. So sad-eyed Lady of the North came to my head. Um, and it seemed close enough as a translation, but it would do additional work. And of course, with a poem, that's what we know, as, and we're all poets here, that every word we use does additional work. And so to guide that work and to curate and the sound patterning that you use, which also is a way of, of you know, moving the poem forward. Certainly. All of those things have to dovetail. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, they really do. I mean, you know, just as I come, you know, going and looking at the notes and just, you know, following them afterwards, you realize that we just point in so many directions. I learned about history of the word pretzel. You know, I learned so many things that just kind of, uh, just sort of convey the, the, the expansiveness of the text. Um, and I just learned so much in so many different ways. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for that structure, for sure. Um, you know, my last question here, I also am keeping an eye on the time. Um, yes. and this, you've kind of, you've really, um, or well, how, how do you feel? Do you have, do you feel like one more question, Mary Jo? Are we over time, Matthias? Or? It's, no, it's, one more question is fine. Yeah, okay. And this one is kind of shorter too, because um, you've, you've sort of talked about some of the challenges already in the process, but I just was wondering, because all of us are, are rather either struggling with our poems or struggling with our translations, figuring that out, um, what were some of the tougher challenges that you faced uh, in the process that uh, sort of snuck up on you or were unexpected in the translation of Purgatorio? And you know, how did you find a solution to, or simply just how to mitigate those challenges? Um, anything that was a surprise or snuck up on you? I think the notes, um, how much time they took me. Um, because for instance, I might end up with a, a two sentence note about Hercules, but I would feel compelled to learn everything I could about Hercules and what Hercules meant to Dante. And of course, all we can know is what commentators said, but there are so many commentators. And so I'm just, I'm doing this deep dive all the time into these situations of Greek myth or Tuscan politics. And at some point I go, why are you doing this, Mary Jo? Just write your little sentence. But part of it is because I want to know what he knew. I want to make sure I get it right in terms of using that. And the fact is that this poem is very fluid in terms of meaning. That's, I guess, what was surprising is you read one commentator and they say, well, so-and-so said this, but later so-and-so said this, my paper says this, and I feel I have good reason because so-and-so said this, and you think, so nobody knows. Right. Um, you know. And then I would kind of try to lean back as a poet and think, what would a poet want to be doing there? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that could be useful as a way to solve who, who do I follow? So I think the, the time consuming aspect of the notes was a, a negative surprise. The fluidity of the poem was also a very um, surprising thing to me, which gives me permission, I think. Right, right. It's sort of like adding your voice to that conversation um, yeah, in, a, yeah. in a unique way as, as the poet that you are and as the, I would, you know, as scholar and researcher at the same time too, because, you know, as I looked at, as I looked at those notes, it's just wonderful to, um, you know, it, it, it shows for me, I think a little bit of where, what, what things were fascinating and compelled your own attention, you know, so I sort of see your process as the translator sort of grappling with these, you know, um, 
facts that are the obscure historical facts of the time there and also uh what references made their way in like you know uh, what was the line by i'm thinking of the line i have it written some here but just the reference to to amy winehouse a, was it a, a perception yeah oh, perception yeah. pushed through pushes through yeah. you know just those unique sort of idiosyncratic relationships to culture now and how they can live in this translation so um so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And hopefully the way that you overcame those challenges um, and the translation is, um, you know, good fuel for us as we work on our own as well, too. Um, so thank you very much, Mary Jo. And um, Matthias, I guess yeah, at that point, I'll hand it over to you. For this wonderful uh, discussion uh, because it points to uh, what you are also pointing to in your um, translator's note, Walter Benjamin's point that every translated work is indebted to its afterlife. I think we have seen the afterlife not really in the afterlife, but in the here and now. And uh, I can see this, uh, you know, progressing and progressing. And I can even imagine a version which will discuss your version in 200 years now, Mary Jo. And we will now end uh, our little gathering with another very short piece of uh, reading. Mary Jo, I think uh, you wanted to or not. Well, I, I feel like we've asked people to stay long enough, so maybe okay. We shouldn't and, do that. Let, but... me just, uh, let me just wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much for coming. We wish you a wonderful evening. Please join us now for the after party. Afterlife and after party goes very well together. Walter is sending you the link once more right now. You'll find it on, the, on your screen in the chat. Please copy and paste. The International Writer Series will return on Wednesday, 10th of November with poet, translator, and editor Matvey Jankelevich who will be presenting poems from A Winter's Notebook and translations of his own of Russian poet Osip Mandelstam. Please stay tuned for more exciting events in the International Writers Series. And thank you so much for joining us. See you in a sec. <laughs>